everyone. <laughs> um, all right, let's get started. Uh, my name is Marit van Dijk. I'm from the Netherlands, as you can tell by my last name, probably. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about how to using testing to develop better software faster. Uh, and this talk is based on an article that I wrote for 97 Things Every Java Programmer Should Know, uh, edited by Kevlin Henney and, and Trisha G. Um, and when I wrote the article, I was like, oh, I need to write everything that I want developers to know about testing in, I had a maximum of 550 words, and it was really hard to narrow it down and be very precise about here are the basics. So I thought, oh, I know, I'll do a talk and I'll have like 45 minutes. And that was still really hard, but I'm going to do my best um, to tell you the things that I want you to know. And I'm going to be honest, probably most of these things you already know. But I've seen some of the tests out there and I know that it bears repeating. So I, will, I hope to show you some examples at the end of what I mean. Um, because honestly, some of the tests that I've seen <laughs> make me feel like this. Or worse yet, the lack of tests. Have you ever opened a project and the, there's the ma it's a Maven project, there's a Maven and there's source code, but there's not even a test folder? Um, last time I gave this talk, someone at the end told me, yeah, you made me feel kind of bad because I feel like I'm doing something wrong if I don't have any tests. So I, I will honestly confess, in the last team that I was a part of, we did have one repository with zero tests. I will also confess it was a very small project that was really easy to smoke test after deployment. But still, I had on my to-do list to at least add one simple smoke test to that repository. Uh, and then I switched jobs. So. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to be honest, you know, sometimes life happens and it's not as perfect as we want it to be, but I still hope I will give you some tips and tricks and, and small things that you can take to work with you and improve the code bases that you're working on. Um, so if you're anything like me, once you finish building a feature, you know, by the time it's done, I'm usually, I'm, I'm quite done with this feature. So if I haven't added the tests beforehand and I have to add them on at the end, that's really counterintuitive. I really hate that. Like I feel like I'm done, but I'm not done yet. So, uh, and also often if I add them at the end, they are more likely to be testing my implementation of the feature rather than what it's supposed to do. Um, and you cannot, add quality in at the end. You have to think about building quality in throughout the process. Um, so what does that mean? If we have a DevOps cycle from planning to building it, deploying it to production, running it in production, um, basic, basically that means that we have testing activities throughout that cycle. And this is from uh, Dan Ashby. Um, Janet Gregory uh, created this model of holistic testing. I will share the slides, I'll share a link to the slides at the end, so don't worry if you're not getting all of this down. Um, they created a model of holistic testing which describes testing activities that you can do throughout the DevOps li life cycle. From, you know, first thinking about the idea, asking questions, all the way to testing hypotheses in production. Uh, so, yes, what I'm telling you is quality means testing all the time, sorry. And the trick is to have the right feedback at the right time so that we are confident enough that when we take the next step, whatever that is, committing the code, pushing it, deploying it, that we feel confident, confident enough that we can do that without too much risk. And of course, how confident we need to be also depends on our context. I worked in an online retail platform before. If we made a mistake, customers might be unhappy. It might cost the company some money. 
but nobody would die. If you're working in uh, a medical field or self-driving cars, you need to be way more confident <laughs> that you can take this to production. So, as far as ac testing activities, it really starts in the beginning. Ask questions. When you start working on a new feature, there, will be, there might be a user story that describes what it's supposed to do. Often, it contains a lot of information, but you can also quickly find information that is missing. Uh, something that helps me, for example, is dr just drawing a simple decision diagram. And every time that you have a diamond where a decision is made, sometimes there will only be the information, what if yes? Okay, but what if no? If this happens, the system should respond in this way. Okay, and what if it doesn't happen? Does it not do anything? Does it do something else? And what other conditions are there? If this happens, are there other things that can happen that I need to deal with? Uh, so start by asking those questions and making sure that you understand what it's supposed to do and why. Um, I'm a big fan of TDD. I think it can really help, uh, especially if you're building something where you're not quite sure where you're going to end up. Uh, so writing failing tests and then taking small steps towards the, the solution that you're aiming for. Uh, is really useful, but even if you're not using formal TDD, just thinking about, okay, what is the behavior that I want, and what are the, the scenarios that I might want to test, is going to help you build a better solution. I especially love TDD for bug fixing, by the way, because writing a failing test to um, reproduce the bug helps me make sure that I understand the bug and how the bug came to be, and then when I fix it, I see that the test passes so I know that I killed the bug, and because I have an automated test, I know that it stays dead. So especially for bug fixes, I really, really like TDD. But also, I confess, I don't do it as much as I should. <laughs> so another question to think about is what could possibly go wrong? And this is something that, as developers, we're not always good at, because we're trying to build something that works, and we know what it's supposed to do. And we forget to think about what it's not supposed to do. So if you're lucky, you'll have great testers that help you with this, that help you to think of what can go wrong, or that help teach you how to think about things that co can go wrong. But uh, some things to think about is, what is the worst headline that could happen if we do this wrong? How could our company end up in the newspaper if we mess this up? Um, and that might not be relevant for all of the stories, but if you know your domain a little bit, that's something to think about. And other things to think about is how could this be abused? I love the term abuse story rather than user story. So how can this software be abused? What if an abusive partner or a stalker X uses this feature? Can they make life miserable for someone? Because we want to make people's lives better and not worse. Um, I have a lot of tester friends. I'm going to share some of their um, information. Uh, this is one. Uh, Elizabeth Sagroba uh, lives in the Netherlands. She wrote a, wrote a blog post called, Have I Tried Enough Weird Stuff? The answer is always no. Um, and she has a lot of suggestions. on. So if you need ideas on what to test, this is a great blog post. I'll share some of the ideas uh, from this blog post as well. Um, the first one, I'll wait for the picture. Uh, the first one is falsehoods developers believe about, well, pretty much anything, really. Any domain object that you have, if you search for falsehoods developers believe about, or, or a random f related phrase, you will find lots and lots of things. I mean, names, everybody has names has a name, but does everybody have a first name and a last name? Does everybody have a middle name? Names, do they never change? What if you get married or divorced? Um, you know, can you have multiple last names, like in Spain? All of these things, you have to think about uh, your context. Um, addresses are fun. Time is especially fun. Anybody who's ever done anything with time in code will know that that's a, that's a special kind of hell. There are whole conference talks just on representing time in code. Um, I highly recommend watching some of those if you want to laugh or cry. Uh, 
maybe a bit of both. Um, or one of my coworkers lives in England and I wanted to get a package to send to her house. And in England, it's very common to have an address without a house number because the house has a name. So there's no house number. Not all systems are able to deal with that. So even the things you think you know, you might not know. So think about that for your domain. Um, inputs are fun. If you give your system to a good tester, they will quickly find out where your input, um, where they can input stuff that, that will break your, your system. Um, so there's a collection on GitHub called the li Big List of Naughty Strings that has lots of fun input that you can try to see whether you've properly encoded everything and are handling uh, special characters and, and everything. Um, so that's a great tip. My absolute favorite, because I hang out on Twitter a lot, if you want my rambles on Twitter, you can find my Twitter handle on all of the slides. This is one of my favorite th Twitter threads ever by Bill Semph. QA engineer walks into a bar, orders a beer, orders zero beer, orders 99999 beer, orders a lizard, orders minus one beers, orders a random string. So this is one tweet. Also, it gets repeated every now and then on, on Twitter, and people keep adding fun stuff. So in the thread, lots of testers throw their weird input at it. At a certain point, InfoSec finds this thread and starts SQL injecting the bar. And there's just all kinds of fun stuff. So if you need testing ideas, this thread is amazing. And also, there, there's a blog post based on this thread that has like the best contributions to, to the whole discussion. So there are lots of ways to think of ideas of what we can test. Yeah, let me get a sip of water, please. Thanks. The next thing to consider is how are we going to test this? So we need to think about how are we going to interact with our application so that we can test the things that we want because we want to make sure something ends up in a database or a certain logic is applied correctly. Uh, so we need to think about how we are going to do that, preferably before we build it. Um, a model that I find useful is the test pyramid. Has everyone heard of the test pyramid? Anybody not heard of the test pyramid? Anybody shy to raise their hand? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Um, so, I find this model useful, uh, and I tend to structure my tests in this way, but I know that it is just a model, and there are also lots of blog posts and conference talks about why this model is bad. Uh, and I also know that some people prefer to have integration tests, um, more heavy on the integration tests and less on the unit tests, because the units can be very small and considered insignificant. But for me, I find this useful because if I have a function or a small component that applies business logic, I'd prefer to test that as close to that logic as I can. So if I can test that logic in unit tests without having to spin up an entire application, I prefer to do that if the logic lives in just a function or, or a small component that is well encapsulated. And those unit tests can be very fast, so I can test a whole bunch of scenarios just on that unit without having the expense of starting up my whole application and everything. But of course, we need to know that all of those units work well together. So we do need some integration tests, but we don't need to repeat all of that logic that we've already uh, tested. But as an example of why we also need integration tests is <laughs> beautifully illustrated by uh, Sander Hogendorn, another speaker from the Netherlands. Um, and there are, uh, there are multiple tweets like this of, you know, windows that open perfectly one by one, but not together. Someone knows what I'm talking about. Um, and also, the whole point of this is if you think about how are we going to test it, you're going to write an application that will be easier for you to test. If you think about how are we as developers going to interact with our application so that we can test it, 
you're probably also going to end up with an application that will be easier to use for other developers that might need to use your APIs or for your users, because you're actually thinking about how are we going to interact with this. You're going to make it easy on yourselves. So you're probably going to make it easier on everyone else as well. And you cannot, just like you cannot add quality at the end, you can't, it's very really hard to add testability at the end because you've already built it. Um, one of my favorite books uh, is Accelerate by Nicole Forsgren, Jess Humble, and uh, Jean Kim. If you haven't read it already, I highly recommend it. Uh, there is also an audio version, if you prefer audio books, uh, that is read by Nicole Fors Forsgren herself, that's available on Audible. Uh, but I, I really appreciate this quote. When developers are involved in creating and maintaining acceptance tests, the code becomes more testable, like we just said. Uh, this is why TDD is important. You know, if they are feeling the pain of code that is hard to test, they're going to improve it because they can. Uh, and the second is, if they work on those tests, they will care more and invest more effort into maintaining and fixing them. I've also had tester friends who were responsible for maintaining a set of six, 700 tests, uh, integration tests on an end-to-end -end environment. And the developers on the team were like, none of those tests can be deleted. And they were super flaky, so every day they would check, okay, what failed? Is that an actual failure in the software, or is the test flaky? They spent lots and lots of time on it. And the de developers said, we cannot delete any of these tests, even the ones that are flaky, we need them. But when we asked the developers, okay, but do you have a test for this, that, or the other, or what even are you testing? We don't know. So they moved the pain of maintaining it to someone else, and now they don't even know what they have it. But we can't remove it, because we need it. Um, yeah, so I really, really recommend having your developers do the test automation instead of having that farmed out to someone else, um, because it will just work better. If we think about how are we going to test it, we're also going to think about what tools are we going to use. Um, use the tools that are intended for what you're trying to do. Lots of logos on the next, next slide. Uh, so for unit testing, we have JUnit or JUnit 5 now. We also have TestNG. This is geared more towards uh, Java. Um, for mocking, we have uh, Mokito or Wiremock, for example. For endpoints, we have Rest Assured, Postman. For BDD, we have Serenity or Cucumber. For performance tests, we have JMeter or Gatling, or, although in my last team we also used Locust, which is Python-based, but it works perfectly. I've never learned Python, and with an example, I was perfectly able to do it. Um, and a bunch of other frameworks, but each with their own use. Uh, so I've had people ask me, can I use Selenium to test endpoints. I don't know, maybe, but probably not a great... Someone is shaking their head. <laughs> My thoughts exactly. Probably not a good idea, because there are tools that are specifically designed to talk to endpoints, and Selenium is specifically designed to talk to a front end. Um, I am slash was a, a core contributor to Cucumber, and we also frequently got the question, can I use Cucumber to do performance tests, because I have all of my scenarios. Exactly. Maybe you can. <laughs> Reading your, fa your expressions there, maybe you can, but you're not going to get the best result, because Cucumber is not built to get you the results of a performance test. It's built to help you with behavior-driven development. So if you use your scenarios to communicate with your business, great. If not, why not just write plain JUnit tests? So also use the tools as they are intended. If you go against how a tool is meant to be used, you're probably going to end up struggling to get it to do what you want or, and or have trouble upgrading it in the future because your use case won't be supported. Um, overall, Tests should cr uh, increase your confidence, like we said. It should give us the confidence that we know we can take the next step, whatever that uh, next step it may be, which was very well said by uh, Maike. Maike is also a, a tester from the Netherlands, 
And she said, it's not our concern as a tester to find bugs, because if you do a whole set of regression tests and you find no bugs, does that mean that you wasted your time? Not really, because we know that for all of the test cases covered by the regression test, we don't have any bugs there. So it was still valuable, even though we didn't find any bugs. Being a tester can be a really crappy job sometimes, because you know if there's no news, it feels like you've wasted your time. But if there is news, it's always bad. So <laughs> be kind to your testers. They're helping you deliver a better product. Tests should be reliable. Flaky tests are really annoying, but also bad. Because if you have a test that's flaky and it's it intermittently failing, at some point you're going to think, oh, that test is failing just because it's flaky. And what if this time it actually is failing because there is a bug? So if you have flaky tests, please fix them if you can. <laughs> yes, we like writing songs in our tweets, don't we, Carl? Um, you know, if you can fix your flaky tests so that they have value, you probably created that test for a reason. So there's behavior there that you want to safeguard. But if you can't, Benjamin had the answer, delete it. Because the time spent analyzing, is it a failure this time? Is it a failure this time? Is it a failure this time? Maybe just do that test by hand, or find a different way to test it, or um, something else. Another thing that breaks my heart whenever I see this happen <laughs> so, we have tests, but we are not running them. And I've literally stood next to developers and they're like, oh, let me just clean, verify, skip test. Why? Why did you just do that? Yes, because they take too long. Ah, but that's an entirely different problem then we need to make sure that we can make them faster so that you don't end up skipping them. Um, so yeah, we're now gonna, I'm going to try to switch to um, give you some demos as well of basically what not to do. I, I, have, I have found some really interesting and I, funny or sad, or both, examples. So let's see if I can uh, switch to my IntelliJ. Yeah. Maybe not. I need to escape this first. No. No. Okay, so who has seen this? Oh, you're not seeing it. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, now I need to. Oh, I need to switch between mirroring, don't I? How about I do the examples at the end and just finish my slides first? Yes. Okay, so I'll just tell you about the examples. I can show them later if you want. So one of the things that I found, super fun, you know, if the test is flaky, how about we just comment out the entire class? Who here has seen that? I see people nodding, yes. So I, I don't think we should ever check in commented code, but it happens, you know, sometimes. But if you have that test class commented out, it's never going to run. So there is a proper way to do that if you're using JUnit. In JUnit 4, you can add ignore it, or in JUnit 5, add disable. And again, I'll, I'll confess, I've done that. At some point, I implemented a new feature, but made a mistake and broke production. So we needed to get a fix out. Unfortunately, on that same project, the test suite was extremely flaky. We were working on fixing that. But I did need to get a fix out, so I had to disable all the tests so the build would pass, get the fix out, and then remove all the disabled. Um, so if you have to 
ignore or disable the tests. Know that you can, uh, between brackets, you can set a reason why. So at least do that so that someone who finds it two years later, I have found tests that had been ignored for two years, not once, but twice in different projects. If people find them in the future, they at least know why was it ignored and do I need to see if I can fix this now uh, or not. I've seen more creative ways to skip tests as well. My favorite one was an add test that was just commented out for four years. I think we can throw this away. We haven't run it in four years. Uh, or also creative, you know, we just uh, comment out the asserts. Now it can't fail. That's also fine. Um, yes. Or should be true, assert false. That's, but we'll get to that. Um, pro tip from one of my friends, never trust a test that you haven't seen fail. Because if you don't know that it fails when it should, do you even have a seatbelt? So uh, an example of that is also assert that and then nothing. This will never fail. You need to assert that something is equal to something else. Uh, IntelliJ will tell you if you try to do this, by the way. Because, you know, we want those tests to fail if something is wrong. And especially a failing test should tell you what's wrong quickly. Um, achievement unlocked. Kevin Henney quoted this part of my article in his GoTo talk earlier this year. So I wasn't even there. A friend sent me this picture. So that was really cool. So in order for the test to tell us what is wrong quickly, make sure that the test tests only one thing. Because if you're testing multiple things in a row and the first thing fails, do the rest of the things still work or not? So we are missing information that way. Or if every test starts with, I need to be logged in as this type of user in order to run the rest of the test. What if login fails? Now I have no information. I know that login doesn't work, but I have no clue about the rest of the application. So make sure to break it up into smaller chunks that will tell you this thing is broken, this thing is broken. Instead of something is broken, good luck figuring out why. Another thing that can help is if you give meaningful names. So the test should describe what the intended behavior is. Um, so not <laughs> assert equals x and y. And now the result will be they are not the same. Um, but maybe not what, what the intended uh, was. Oh, no, yeah, that was different. It was assert equals this, assert true, this equals that. But then you get an, it should have been true, but it wasn't. So instead, you need the assert equals actual value, ex expected value. So think about the readability of your tests. Um, if the test fails, I want to have enough information in my test to see what happened. This is the state that we set up. This is the action that we performed. This is the result that we expected. Uh, for production code, we tend to make things dry and reuse a bunch of stuff. For testing, maybe don't always do that because you want to be able to read the test and know what's going on without having to go find it everywhere. Um, and use meaningful variable names. You know, naming is hard, but try. Um, and, and again, with the name of the test, express the behavior that you want and, and why. Um, and all in all, think about what value do these tests bring us versus the costs, not just of writing them and creating them in the first place, which is a good idea because it will help you when you're implementing a feature, but also of running them, especially if they take a really long time. I know for myself, if the build takes too long, I'm off reading Twitter and I might come back but it might take me a little bit longer than the build. So make sure that the build is fast so that you can continue. Um, and also think about the cost of having to analyze the failures like we discussed, because uh, failing, running the test can take some time, but if something fails and you need to figure out why, 
um, possibly on something that you were not, never involved in in the first place, that's going to take you a lot of time. Um, a quote from uh, Bart Enkelaar, an ex-coworker of mine, test code is at least as important as the production code because it's your safeguard that your production code is okay or at least as okay as your test set is. Um, yeah, so all in all, please test your code. Normally I would wear this shirt on the left, but not today. Um, and uh, I hope I was able to tell you at least something that was useful. Um, you can find the slides here. And I have no idea how we are for time. Anyone? Sorry? <laughs> okay. So do you want to see some examples or? Yes. Talk is cheap. Show us the code. Okay. Um, Where do I do this again, uh, Ko? Is it, is it mirrored? Yay! I know, I'm a professional. Anyway. Yes. So, you know, fun times. There's a test, or at least there was a test at some... Oh, yeah, you can see it ish. Um, commented out tests. I mean, honestly, please, no. So, the at ignore. If you have to ignore tests, do it this way. Um, but better yet, do use uh, JUnit 5, because JUnit 4 is old. And you can put a reason as to why the test is being ignored, which will help whoever finds this ignored tests in hopefully sooner than two years uh, to know why it was ignored. Um, yeah, so if you comment out at test, the test won't run. Uh, so that's very creative, but also please don't do that. Or an example that I've gotten previously when I've given this talk is people will just comment out the asserts. Now it will never fail. Great, but it's still running, so it's costing you time and not giving you any value. So don't do that either. Um, I've seen tests without any assertions at all, which is great if you're measuring code coverage, but it's really also not bringing you any value in terms of testing that it does what it's supposed to. Um, tests that will never fail assert that something. Uh, IntelliJ will tell you here. but it won't give you anything useful. But you should be doing is something like is equal to how I can type when people are watching. Do you get that too? Or just me? So now it will say, and if we put this, oh, then my MacBook objects. Now we have a test that will fail and we can see that the test actually works. Oh. Ah. Wrong button. Um, a test should tell us what's wrong. So this one, if I assert true that this value is the same as the, as the other value, if it fails, it will just say, I expected it to be true, but it's false. It won't tell me what the expected and the actual value was. So here IntelliJ can help you to make it assert equals. 
I saw this in real life. So the test said it should be true, but then it's asserting that it's false. So if this fails, I'm wondering why. Why? Which is it? Should it be true or false? What do you want? So be clearer in your intentions. Um, testing multiple things in a row. I've seen this as well. I, I mean, the examples that I've created are fairly trivial, but I've seen, you know, here's a collection. Let's write one test. If it's empty, it should be empty. If there's one, it should be one. Yeah. So those are all separate tests. So um, instead, you know, what if it's empty? What if it has size one? What if it has multiple items? Um, split that into multiple tests. Uh, and finally, also, real example. I have tests, test scenario one. So if that fails, that's super clear, right? It's clear what should be happen, it's clear what's wrong. Test scenario two, sure. So tell me at least what the scenario is about. This should happen. If this, that should happen. Um, because a year down the line, I'm not going to remember what's going to, you know, I, maybe even if I implemented the feature myself, I'm not going to remember all the details a year from now. And especially not if it was implemented by someone else. So, yeah. Questions, comments, yes. It's working, great. Have you seen integration tests written in JUnit style? I mean, like JUnit tests, and you couldn't figure it out if it's really in an integration test, so written in Java, basically. Yes, I have. It's a good practice? Uh, it can be if you're clear that it's an integration test that you make sure that you start uh, the stuff that you need. Um, so I have used Cucumber for integration tests. So you describe the behavior in a feature file and then add the glue code or the Java code to perform those steps. Um, I find that useful if you want to have like a, a, a plain language version of, of what it's supposed to do. But yes, you can also use uh, JUnit um, and, and write integration tests. Uh, and if, you're, if the developers are the only users of those tests, I would rather use JUnit for integration tests than add an extra abstraction level uh, of writing plain, t plain text. So with regards to your question, uh, I've seen integration tests that uh, were written in JUnit style. Then the client said, oh, we want to see all those tests in a plain text. So we wrote, uh, we actually added an abstractization layer on top of those tests. And guess what? How many times did they look over it? Never. All of zero, so yes. Exactly. They just <laughs> add complexity on top of it. And then you have to maintain something more. And when you think about tests, it, it's another headache that you don't like. And you end up hating writing tests. Why? Because you added another layer on top of your unit tests or integration tests that were actually meant to uh, give you confidence like you pre previously said. Yeah, yeah. and I, I have actually used feature files uh, to send to a business uh, person who asked, okay, so what scenarios have you tested? Uh, so I sent her the feature files uh, as text files to say, okay, here are the scenarios that we tested, so you have an idea of, of what we looked for. But we've also had uh, business an uh, analysts or, uh, that were confident enough to just sit side by side with the developer and just look at the test. And if the test has at least a name, oh, this is what's going on, see, we are setting up this type of object, we are performing this type of action and then checking this. And they were fine with that, if they are a little bit confident enough that they can understand uh, and communicate with the developer, that also works. Of course, it helps that uh, at Bol.com we collaborate fairly closely with uh, um, uh, business people, uh, so they're they're close by and 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 easy to talk to. Um, and and that's not true for all companies. Sometimes business is much much further away, and then uh, you might not have that option. Anything else? Uh. <laughs> um, 
another workaround that I like to apply whenever somebody uh, is uh, asking for like a Gherkin, a Gherkin language test is within the name of the test, I write given, when, then. And yeah. I try to keep them so small yeah. that you don't have a lot of conditions. So yep. given I'm a logged in user, I can have a name, I can have an ID or whatever. I can ha perform this function or, yes. yeah. And uh, if you also want to generate a report, which you can integrate easily in any framework, uh, that there are a lot of frameworks out there, uh, then the tests read well. Yes. The camel case, honestly, it's not very readable. No, uh, so for business. Um, that's why you can do the uh, display name. So, where you can explain in the display name, so then you can write a sentence. Um, if you're using Kotlin, is anybody using Kotlin? Other than Co? Team Kotlin is too small, people. Try, give it a try, it's lovely. You don't need a display. So in Kotlin, you can write fun, and you can write a method name in backticks. So you can just r write a sentence, um, which is really useful. We're waiting for Yeah. So uh, we, we translated a lot of microservices to Kotlin using IntelliJ. Yay. <laughs> Yes, I get paid to say that, but I really, really feel that way as well. <laughs> so, if you have any other examples of like really, really bad tests, please let me know so I can add them for fun. So, thank you.